We continue our study through the Bible, and this week we are brought to the Song of Solomon. And we'll be studying tonight the first three chapters of the Song of Solomon. And so we encourage you to read them over, join with us at 7 o'clock as we gather to worship the Lord and continue our study through the Bible. This morning we'd like to draw your attention to the Song of Solomon, chapter 2, beginning with verse 2. Now the Song of Solomon as a whole book speaks of the love between the bride and the groom. It is seen by many to be an allegory, expressing the relationship between Christ and his church. And the book is best appreciated and best understood if you will see it as a spiritual allegory dealing with that love that God desires to exist between Christ and his church. And seeing it in that light, in verse 2, Christ the groom speaks of his love for his bride. And he declares, as a lily among thorns, so is my love among the daughters. Talking of his church, his bride, as his love. And she stands out against the backdrop of the world that is filled with darkness, sin, thorns. Thorns, you remember, were the curse that came as the result of sin. And a world that is cursed because of sin. His bride stands out, his love stands out as a lily among the thorns. In verse 3, the bride then begins to respond to the love that the groom has expressed. And she says, as an apple tree among the trees of the wood, so is my beloved among the sons. I sat down under his shadow with great delight, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. Walking through the woods, for the most part, the trees that you find are non-fruit-bearing trees. In the woods you find many beautiful trees, beautiful blossoms. Some of the trees are outstanding because of their size, others because of their symmetry. While others still, there's a glorious fragrance. But if you are going through the woods and you are hungry and you are thirsty, and you would come across an apple tree loaded with beautiful, luscious-looking apples. It would stand out amongst all of the other trees because it would have the capacity of satisfying your hunger and quenching your thirst. And so as the bridegroom I mean, as the bride likens her groom to an apple tree among the trees of the woods, she is declaring that her tree is special because it supplies for her both nourishment, sustenance, as well as refreshment, life, water, quenches her thirst. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. If a person eats of me, he will never hunger again. Again, Jesus said, I am the water of life. And to drink of him, he said, would quench your thirst forever. Jesus promises full satisfaction to all of those who will partake of him. Now, there are many things in the world that give promise of satisfying. 
Madison Avenue understands human nature quite well. And there's a tremendous amount of psychology used in advertising, appealing to people's desires. And we desire happiness. Notice how many of the products have as the underlying kind of a motive or incentive to buy them. This will bring you happiness. Happiness is. We long for a good life. And how many of the products are advertised with the idea of living is or this is life or you see them, you know, having a party, having fun. Everybody is, is enjoying things because they're drinking Cokes. And, uh, you know, all you have to do is drink Coke and you've just discovered life. This is the real reason for living, you know. And this is what it's all about. And, and they... they seek to give to you the impression that if you will just purchase this product, use this product, that your life will finally take on real meaning, your smile will have a luster that will attract everyone to you. And you will be popular and you will be everything you've desired to be. It's all in this product. But the world's promises for happiness and fulfillment, for satisfaction, are empty. Because as we pursue after these things and finally achieve or attain, then we suddenly realize they are empty, they are not fulfilling. Ted Turner, CNN magnet, was talking about success. And he said, it's a bore. Life is boring. Donald Trump, in talking to Barbara Walters, said, it's the chase that is exciting. The conquest is disappointing. And so with so many things in life, it's the hope, it's the prospect that's exciting. But once achieved or attained, you find just as Jesus said to the woman at the well, you drink of this water, you're going to thirst again. It's not going to satisfy. It's not going to bring you a lasting satisfaction. It may for the moment, like a Coke, quench your thirst, but in five minutes, you're going to be even thirstier than you were before. Drink of this water, you'll thirst again. But as the bride speaks of her groom, he's as an apple tree among the trees of the wood. He supplies for my sustenance. He quenches my thirst. You know, many times in traveling in foreign countries, the questionable thing is the water. And thus when I am traveling, and I think there's something about flying on planes, you get dehydrated, and I am so thirsty when I've traveled to a foreign country. I get there and I just can't get enough to drink. And sometimes you don't know when you're going to be traveling through that country whether the water will be fit wherever you go. We usually try to take Evie on with us, but we always carry a bag of apples. Because always, if you get real thirsty, you can find that an apple will quench your thirst. Great for thirst quenching. And it also is nourishing. And so I see it rather interesting that she sees him as an apple tree among the trees of the wood, so is my beloved among the sons. No one can quite satisfy the need of your life like Jesus. No one can quench the thirst that you experience like Jesus. She said then, 
that she sat down under his shadow with great delight. Oh, how delightful it is to just sit there overshadowed by him, by his love. There is a song that used to be sung in church. In fact, I used to sing it years ago called Overshadowed. And it's a song that speaks of how desolate my life would be. How dark and drear my nights and days. If Jesus' face I could not see. To lighten all earth's weary ways. I'm overshadowed by his mighty love. Love eternal, pure. Overshadowed by his mighty love. Safe, secure. He died to ransom me. He lives to keep me day by day, overshadowed by his mighty love, love that brightens all my way. In Psalm 91, the psalmist said, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. That place in life where I've come to this relationship with Jesus Christ, where my life is just overshadowed by his love. Knowing that he is there, I, I don't fear. Knowing that I'm covered by his love. I don't have to be worried about what tomorrow may bring. I know the Lord will be there to overshadow me. To help me. You know, there are a lot of times when shadows do create fears. If you're walking down the road by yourself at night and you pass a street light and you watch your shadow as it lengthens, if suddenly there is a second shadow that you see beside yours, it's a little frightening. You wonder, who is it? And what is it that is casting another shadow next to mine along the path? But when it is Jesus under which we have come to rest, sitting under his shadow, we find great delight. The question is, do you really find great delight in the presence of the Lord? Do you long to just sit there in his presence, just feeling and experiencing his love. She said, under the shadow, I found great delight. And then she said, his fruit was sweet to my taste. He's like an apple tree among the woods. I partook of him. And his fruit was sweet to my taste. The invitation of the scripture is taste and see that the Lord is good. You see, you can't really know until you taste for yourself. I can tell you all about it. I can tell you how good it is to walk with the Lord. I can tell you how wonderful it is to experience His love. I can tell you of all of the things that the Lord does for me and will do for you. But you will never know until you taste for yourself. You may just believe, well, I'm putting you on. It might happen for you, and I'm glad it helps you, but, you know. And, and there are a lot of people who have that attitude. They, they just won't taste for themselves. Well, I'm glad you found something that satisfies you. That's good, you know. And you're not on drugs anymore, and you're, you know, sober, and that's nice, you know. And I'm glad for you. But they don't taste for themselves. Oh, taste and see. The Lord is good. You know, the life in Christ 
is a life that is so rich that it can only be described in superlatives. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life. But then he added, and that more abundantly. Not just life, but full, rich, abundant life. So as Peter speaks about the joy that we have in Jesus, he just doesn't say, oh, it's so much joy in the Lord. He said, it is a joy unspeakable and it's full of glory. The word unspeakable is indescribable. You can't describe the joy. It's full of glory. As the scripture speaks about the peace that we have in Christ, it isn't just, oh, you'll have real peace in Jesus. It's a peace that passes human understanding. As Paul is writing to the Ephesians, expressing his desire that they might know the length and the breadth and the depth and the height of the love of Christ, he said, which passes knowledge or which is unknowable. He's actually, interestingly enough, praying that you can know something that you can't know. Impossible to know. It, 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 you, that is, you cannot know it on the human level of experience. You've never experienced anything in your life on the human level that is equal to the love that you will experience in Jesus Christ. His love excels anything that you can ever know or experience on the human level. And so that you might know the love of Christ which passes Knowledge exceeds our capacity to know. Because the life in Christ is beyond our understanding, the peace, the love is beyond our knowledge, because the joy is indescribable, we as Christians always find ourselves hard-pressed to describe to others what we have in Jesus. We find ourselves sort of fumbling, and we say, oh, well, it's just so wonderful, but we run out of adjectives uh, because it's more than wonderful. Uh, we say, oh, it's such joy. No, it's more than joy. It's joy that's indescribable. It's full of glory. And, and we try to tell people who have only experienced life on the human plane, have not yet been born again and know the spiritual life, we try to share with them a little bit of, of that dimension of the Spirit and, and we find that it's impossible because there is not a vocabulary. Words haven't been created that can describe the things that God has for those who love Him and who are drawn by His love to Himself and who have tasted. She said, I tasted his fruit and it was sweet oh taste and see the Lord is good now there are thousands of people here this morning that will testify to the fact that they have tasted and it's wonderful it's sweet it's good but you'll never know until you personally taste for yourself. Now, there are other cynics who have never tasted. And they will tell you, oh, it's all made up. There's nothing to it. It's just a part of the figment of their imagination. There is no God and, you know, it... it it's really not so. They've never tasted and they will be cynical about what we have to say who have tasted. And there are some who say, well, I tried the church and I, I just didn't find my answer in the church. It's interesting, the Bible doesn't say, oh, taste and see, that the church is good. It says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. 
And I feel sorry for some people who have tasted of the church because, you see, the church many times is filled with man's rituals and man's ordinances. And you go to church hoping to taste of the things of eternal life, and all you get is a bunch of man's garbage. And you go away and you say, yeah, it was rotten, bitter, sour. But the invitation is to taste of the Lord. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. In fact, the psalmist who said that said, for it tastes like honey in the rock. It's sweet. That's what the bride said. I ate of his fruit, and it was sweet to my taste. And then she said, he brought me into his banqueting house, and his banner over me, was love. A couple of years ago, we were the guest of the King of Tonga. And at his birthday party, we were brought to, well, it really wasn't a banqueting house. It was out on the soccer field. But there were Table after table after table, some 300 feet long, loaded with food. There was probably a quarter of a mile of food <laughs> loaded on these tables. Little succulent pigs and all kinds of fruit and just all of these tables. And each of the island groups had their banners above their tables so that the island groups would know where they could go for their feast. The king had provided royally uh, a, a tremendous banquet for his birthday. I've never seen so much food in all my life. And we found that island group that we were to eat with and we sat down and enjoyed thoroughly of that feast. The bride said he brought me into his banqueting house where he has provided so bountifully and so wonderfully for us. But have you ever gone into a large banquet hall where there was to be a dinner and you see the thousands of settings, but you don't know where you're supposed to sit. And you start looking around to find the place where you're supposed to sit. And you see the various banners that are above the different portions of the banquet hall and find you spot Santa Ana, and you're, oh, they're over that way. And so you get over there and you start looking around the table for your name tag. And finally, you find the place. There's my name tag. Here's where I sit. And so you sit down. That's what the bride is saying. He brought me into his banqueting hall. When I found the place where I was to sit, I found that the banner over me was love. He's given me such a special place. Love. He loves me. More than I can understand. More than I can know. He loves me. His love for me is unconditional love. You know, there are a lot of times during a courtship that we are doing our best to hide the truth about ourselves with that one that we've come to love. For we're afraid that if they know the truth about us, they won't love us anymore. And so we go into this little bit of deceit. 
So they spill Coke on us and we say, oh, that's all right. My, it doesn't matter, you know. I can get it clean. You know, no problem. When inside we're thinking, you clumsy oaf, what's wrong with you? <laughs> and after he's taken us out to McDonald's for dinner three nights in a row, but we're smiling. Oh, McDonald's, wonderful. Oh, I think that's great. Yes, I like fries, you know, and Big Macs, and, uh, you know. <laughs> and you act so sweet and so, oh, I sure, I don't eat much, and that's fine, you know. Good idea. And in your mind, you're thinking, you cheapskate. Why don't you take me to Rubens, you know? <laughs> but wait. We don't want to reveal the truth. We want them to think that we are always sweet and smiling and we never get angry or upset. That we are the soul of graciousness. And we want them to believe that because we're afraid if they really knew the truth, they might not like us. And then we get married. <laughs> and it's such a shock when we learn the truth. As they begin to express their real feelings. But you know what? The wonderful thing about the love of Jesus for you is that he knew the truth all the while. He knew everything there is to know about you, even things you don't know yourself. He knew every bad quality that you possess. And he loved you anyhow. He loved you in spite of your weaknesses. Now, we have a hard time reckoning with this because there are times when we don't even love ourselves. There are times when we are so angry with ourselves over our weaknesses, over our failings, over what we've done. And we get upset with ourselves and we, we just sort of castigate ourselves. But the Lord knows me backwards and forwards, inside and out, upside and down, and still he loves me. And he invites me into his banqueting house. And his banner over me is love. He wishes to announce to the world, to the whole assembly, this is the one that I love. This is my love. You see, that's exactly what the Lord is seeking with you today. He's seeking with you a loving relationship. He doesn't want a legal relationship with you. He doesn't want you obeying him because you fear the consequences of not obeying. And I think that many times we make a real mistake when we try to uh, emphasize, you know, the judgment of God that's going to fall upon those that are disobedient. You know, and we, we try to dangle them over hell, you know, and, and put the fear of God in their hearts, you know. So we're sitting there quivering and shaking in the presence of God, afraid to smile or do anything else lest we get snuffed, you know. And, and we, we have that kind of a relationship with God where I'm scared silly, but I'll do it because I don't want to be fried, you know. And, and so uh, we, we have this legal relationship with God. He doesn't want that kind of a relationship with you. No more than you want that kind of a relationship with your wife or your husband. Do it, baby, or I'll beat the tar out of you, you know. I want her to do things because she loves me. Not because she fears my temper or my wrath or my anger. 
Paul said, the love of Christ constrains us. It's his love that motivates me. It's his love that draws me. He invites me into his banqueting house. And his banner over me is love. For he loves me with a love that I can't understand because it's beyond anything on the human plane. You've never experienced a love in all your life like the love of Jesus Christ for you, like the love that God has for you. A love that is constant, a love that is pure, a love that is strong, a love that overcomes my weaknesses and my failures and seeks only my good and my best. And many times, I discover God's love the most when I am and have been the worst. It is then when I realize he does love me. So many times when I've had a bad day, and I've been out of sorts, and I'm sort of down on myself. God will just do something special for me. Just one of those neat little things that has written all over it in big bold letters, I love you. And I say, oh Lord, I can't believe it. You're so good. When I am so miserable and unworthy and undeserving is when God then seeks to display and show me his love so many times just to let me know that his love for me doesn't alter from day to day with my moods or with my swing of, of temperament but his love is constant and enduring he loves me with an everlasting love he loves me with a love that doesn't stop that doesn't diminish. He invites me into his banqueting house and he puts over me the banner love. And I sit there basking in the love of my king as I sit under the shadow of his grace. The apple tree among the woods so is my beloved among the sons. I sat down under his shadow with great delight, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. And he brought me into his banqueting house, and his banner over me was love. He loves you. Taste and see. He loves you. Father, we thank you for that love. That love that we've come to taste, to experience, to know. And Father, we pray for those who have not yet tasted. May they, Lord, this day come to know the love of God, which passes human knowledge. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Shall we stand? Could we with ink the ocean fill and were the skies of parchment made? Were every blade of grass a quill and every man a scribe by trade to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry? Nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. O oh, love of God, how rich, how pure, how measureless and strong. Have you experienced it? Have you tasted of it? He is inviting you today into his banqueting house. As you come in and look for your place to sit down, you'll find it's right next to the king. The banner over it is love. He loves you. And he desires that you respond to his love. 
that you come to this loving relationship where you do because you love to do as you respond to his love for you. If you haven't yet tasted, I encourage you to go back to the prayer room. Pastors and counselors will be back there to pray with you that you might come into this relationship that God is longing to have with you today if you'll just but open your heart to him. And I pray this week that as you go, you might have a new sense of God's love. May the Lord just manifest in a lot of beautiful, little, subtle ways his love for you. That you might realize that it's his love that caused him to send his son. It's his love that drew you to himself. It's his love that has caused him to desire to spend eternity with you. May you know it. In Jesus' name.